And you can see we're moving up to chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, be our focus. But just before we get started, last night one of the faculty for the middle schoolers uh, was chatting with me and asked me about quaint Scottish phrases that are quite famous and I was sharing with them one and so I thought I'd share it with you. So if you uh, see somebody and say, cock a wee finger, will ya? Uh, cock a wee finger, will ya? Come try it. Cock a wee oh, finger, will ya? You have to cock your wee tiny pinky finger. Anybody have an idea what that means? Cock a wee finger, will ya? It means I'm inviting you to a cup of tea where you can cock your finger and hold your teacup. Although if you're in a pub, it's an invitation to buy them a whiskey, but we won't go there. So. <laughs> Better tea. <laughs> Well, we come now to chapter 2 in first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, verses 1 to 4. Just four verses. For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our reception among you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and been treated abusively in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. Our, our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not intending to please people, but to please God who examines our hearts. It's quite clear that the focus in this passage is on the gospel, which is better means the good news. It's reiterated twice in this passage. That's a simple biblical study truth. Something is repeated. It's obviously drawing attention. First in verse 2. Do you see it there with me? As you know, we had boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God. And then it's a second time we find it in verse 4. Just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. It is obvious then that we should be clear as to what the New Testament means by the gospel or good news. In the previous chapter, yesterday, we saw the apostle refer to it as our gospel because there are different ideas about. Good news. Rome said it had good news in the power of the Caesar. The Greeks had good news in the power of culture and education. We're talking about the good news of the New Testament. It is, as I would explain it, it's the announcement of good news that in Jesus Christ, God's grand purpose of recreating all things new has now commenced, commenced even in the coming of Jesus. And the point about any sort of good news is that you want to share it with everyone in a world that is so full of quite a lot of bad news. In fact, this idea of proclaiming the gospel, the good news, is so central in this passage that it is really exhorting us, I think, to actually be what we could call good news people. Good news people. One of uh, our young men here has a shirt on today that says, Think Christianly. Want a model? No. <laughs> this idea of exemplary Christian living and now that is displayed in good news people. Not just that we share the good news, which of course we do, but we are represent representatives of good news. Now for the sake of clarity, I want to begin at the end of this passage and work our way to the beginning. Just so we'll make it clearer as we look at what the Apostle Paul has to say here about being good news people. He is, first of all, getting at our motivation. 
in proclaiming the gospel or in actually being good news people? What is our motivation? And the Bible here suggests that what we could refer to as good motivation or right motivation comes when we understand, first of all, that we are approved by God for such a role as announcing the good news to the world. You see that with me in verse 4 at the very end? But just as we have been approved by God. Where does your sense of approval come from? To whom do you turn for approval? Certain stages of our life, we are so affected by who or who does not approve of us. I challenge you as good news people to find your approval ultimately from God over and above everything else. Does that affect your motivation too as it does mine if I know God approves of me? And again, the Bible here suggests what we could refer to as good motivation or right motivation comes when we understand not only are we approved by God, but that we are entrusted by God for such a role as announcing being good news to the world. Do you see that now further on in verse 4? But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. The word entrusted that Paul uses here has the idea of faith in its very root. Pistuthenai. Pistuthenai is the literal Greek word, so that it's suggesting the idea that, astounding as it may seem to you, God has faith in you. We always think about the call for our faith in God, and that's many places in the scripture. But here it is the notion that Odysseus addresses the question, does God, do you understand God has faith in you? He is entrusted to you. And it changes your life when you can understand God actually has faith in me. To do his work, to do his purpose such that he freely and happily gives us this immense responsibility of telling the whole wide world the good news of Jesus, to be good news people. This is what it means here when it says this remarkable thing that God himself actually entrusts you and me, puts his faith in us to be good news people. And that to me is highly motivating. We are challenged so often in our church circles, do you trust Jesus? Equally in the scripture, the question is, does Jesus trust you? Can he put his faith in you and trust his purposes to you? And then finally, the Bible here suggests that what we could refer to as good motivation, right motivation, comes when we understand our motivation in everything is or ought to be to please God. Do you see that with me at the very end of verse 4? Just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not intending to please people, but to please God who examines our hearts. It hits me square in the face, right into my gut, to ask myself the very honest question. Is my highest motivation to live my entire life in such a way that I can say I'm doing my utmost not to please myself or some other important authority, but ultimately to please God. It changes your life. You say, my life is about pleasing God, not myself. Who are you and I concerned about pleasing? We struggle most with living our lives to please ourselves, or a boss, or a 
boyfriend or girlfriend or a potential life partner. <coughs> People I work with have come from a culture where their whole life is pleasing the government so they don't get in trouble. The Bible here calls us to the highest standard, the highest objective, the highest motivation to please God. This is the best reason of all to be good news people because our heart's desire is to please God. And this is precisely why the Paul, Apostle Paul makes it an issue of the heart, doesn't he? As he says so clearly here, so we speak not intending to please people, but to please God who examines our hearts. What is in your heart toward God? Not just your actions that anybody can kind of act or portray or learn the P's and Q's, but what's in your heart? So now we move briefly backwards in the passage, now back to verse 2, where it is quite clear that the emphasis is on the boldness, not only the motivation, but now the boldness of good news people as we should be. You see that in verse 2? After we had already suffered and been treated abusively in Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God. The term boldness here, of course, is the opposite of timidity or fear-based, shrinking back with uncertainty. It is rather... Parasia atsomai, the word that the middle school have on their back. Parasia, it's the same basic root. Here it's parasia atsomai, different form, but the same root. It means courage, boldness, confidence, openness, honest, declarative, speaking out, confidently demonstrating such good news about Jesus. And I think that the Apostle Paul is describing here what I would be bold to refer to as the school of gospel openness or gospel boldness. So as to address the question, where and how is good news boldness learned? Paul, I think, is alluding to three schools wherein gospel boldness can be learned. It's not in the language right here in the text, but I think this is what the Bible is alluding to. The first is the school of opposition. That is perhaps suggested at the end of verse 2, where the apostle writes about boldness for the gospel with this very language, as it says, amid much opposition. You and I will learn to be bold when we simply learn to expect there will be opposition if you stand for Christ. Even now, some of you may be facing that. There's different levels, different degrees. The refugees I work with have come from unbelievable opposition to anything resembling the Christian faith. But if you expect that, if you believe Paul here, then you will learn to be bold because it's already expected. Second is the school of maltreatment. That is perhaps suggested in the middle of verse 2. After we had already suffered and been treated abusively in Philippi. And more than likely what Paul means here is not physical abuse, but verbal abuse that would be lesser. And so other scholars think the better translation of that would be maltreatment. You and I will learn to be bold when we are so committed to the good news of Jesus Christ that we happily share it in every way we can, even when the response towards that, towards us, is maltreatment. And the third is the school, surprising as it may be, the school of suffering. You see that so plainly at the beginning of verse 2? After we had already suffered and been treated abusively or maltreatment, as you know, we had the boldness. 
And here, the term the apostle used is very clearly actual physical harm, even to the point of imprisonment and execution. Do you see that little addition in verse 2? When it says, as you know, almost hidden away and unnoticed, we skip over it after we had already suffered and been treated abusively in Philippi. As you know, it's really hugely significant, isn't it? Because it tells us that something was known about Paul and his fellow Christians who proclaimed the good news in Philippi. It is telling us about what was known of them, their reputation. It is telling us about the source of their notoriety, their fame, what stood out for them. And what was it that they were known for? Riches and wealth, advanced educational degrees, political and social power, family status, artistic, creative abilities. They were known for suffering. This was their qualification. In the New Testament, the qualification, the credentials behind your faith was not PhD or DMA or Whatever it might be, it was prison, confiscation, confiscation of your goods, and for quite a few Christians, execution. You and I will learn to be bold when the qualification we seek for serving Christ is that our willingness to embrace even suffering. I don't advocate that we go out and search for that or we make that happen. But if that comes your way, that is the highest credential. You and I will learn to be bold when we are willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel the sake of the good news, to be such good news people that if it embraces literal suffering, we say yes, the high call of God. Sadly, threatening to many people this great good news that their response is anger or ridicule, imprisonment, torture, sometimes execution. So I want to conclude today with a story from the people I work with. As you've heard me say a few times, I work with refugees all from the Mideast. They're largely Iranian, about 50% of our church is Iranian people, and the others are Kurdish that span the country of Iran, Iraq, Syria, and northern, northwest Turkey and Afghans who speak Farsi, some of them, common Persian language and Arabic. So it's rather a challenge in our church. Everything has to be translated twice from English to Farsi and English to Arabic. It's hard for me because that means everything is automatically three times as long. And that's not my gift. <laughs> But this is Sohail and his wife Mehla. Sohail has been with us about three years. He's now one of our leaders. He leads a small group. We call them LTGs, Life Transformation Groups. He leads one. He, his wife is still in his home city of Tehran. So Hale was secretly led to faith in Jesus through a friend, and together they started a house church in Sohail's flat. That house church was raided by the secret 
Basijid, mosque police. He was arrested. And he was put in the notorious Evan prison in the heart of Tehran. You could Google Evan, E V I N, prison, and it'll have incredible horror stories of what happens in there. And for 13 months, he was imprisoned and every day tortured, all in one way, so that just now, Sohail is recovering from all of his upper body muscles and joints are out of whack and he's had to have lots of physiotherapy as the torture they had, they tied, attached things that held his thumbs and then he was hung over a rafter by hanging with his body weight on his thumbs for hours and hours. And there's something about the pull on the thumbs more than any other the fingers that actually just stems the muscles and the ligaments and the bones and he he's had years now of trying to get that sorted. His wife is still there. He's received now his visa and we're working with him to secure passport and visa by law. She is allowed to come because she's married to him. She is struggling with anger that his conversion to Jesus has cost all this, not only for him, but for her. Oh, he is certain that as she comes, whenever that can be, we hope sometime this autumn that he, she will embrace the good news as she meets good news people in the Upper Room Church. Suffering is real. You and I may never have that level, but it happens. And the church I lead this Stories like this are rife. So Hale would be the first to say it was his privilege, his credentials are his suffering. So we conclude today by praying for So Hale and Mehla, and also for you and for me that we would be bold for the gospel. That we would be good news people. So bold we would embrace the school of opposition, the school of maltreatment, the school of suffering. Lord Jesus, I pray for Sohail and Mehla. Thank you for Sohail and his deep commitment to you. Thank you for his love of the Bible, his leading this small group and really doing a good job. Thank you for that house church he started at great risk in his flat and paid the price. Thank you for Mehla, and we pray that you keep working on her, give her a... She, she really loves him, and she's desperate to come be with him, but she's also angry at his conversion. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would tug on her. I pray for each student here as we <clears throat> think about our lives. A few of us will probably suffer in that way, but we might in other ways, and different levels. <clears throat> I pray that we would be so committed to be good news people, to be bold for the gospel, whatever the cost we would embrace. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.